I'm looking at a very interesting debate, and I uh, encourage you uh, to ask questions uh, and try to find answers. And now I'm handing over uh, the floor to my colleague uh, Yorgo Jatsimatsakis for uh, chairing our first panel on energy. Thank you, Adina, and thank you also for taking the initiative of this uh, seminar here, Connecting Europe's Transport and Energy Infrastructures. Uh, we know that it's uh, a very crucial time to discuss this. I represent here uh, Germany as a member state, and Germany this week took an important decision. Um, my government and my party is also part of the government decided to step out of nuclear power. This means that we have to envisage a total change uh, of the energy infrastructure in, in Germany, which is maybe, well, it's the biggest uh, energy market in Europe. And we are keen now in Germany on implementing the uh, internal market, which is not implemented yet. But in order to do so, we need tremendous um, investments into infrastructure. So that is why I'm uh, very happy to chair this first uh, session here on energy infrastructure, where we definitely will deal also with the question of how to finance this, um, uh, how to discuss the regulatory framework, who does what, what will be done on the European level, which is definitely something which will be discussed also in the last uh, podium that will be chaired by our colleague Ramona Manescu, where the structural funds are in the forefront. But what kind of transport infrastructure that will be, be discussed with uh, Gesine. But uh, next to the funding, it's the energy infrastructure priorities. What exactly are the priorities? Storage capacity uh, in order to have more access uh, to, for renewables, or gas? Do we have to concentrate on Nabucco, on South Stream, on other elements, and so on and so forth? And I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome here uh, with me um, two uh, connoisseurs of uh, the topic. Uh, I would like to um, introduce to you Jean Arnaud, Arnold Vinois. He's head of unit of uh, DG Energy uh, the, of the European Commission. He is uh, a Belgian and uh, from 1987 already with the European Commission. And since April 2006, he's head of the unit responsible for energy policy, security, uh, of supply and networks of the Director General for Energy. I can tell you that uh, we have made very good um, experiences with Commissioner Oettinger so far. Uh, we know that he's somebody who um, not only masters the language very well, but masters the topic, and that's especially interesting, the topic very, very well, so we feel in very good hands with him, and we would like to know your view on this. Uh, but I would also like to uh, introduce to you, you José Braz. Uh, he's Portuguese. He holds degrees in economics from the Boston University and from the Business University in Cape Town. And he is currently an executive board member of ERSE, the Portuguese energy regulator. And he's chairman of the European Energy Regulators. And maybe I should tell you that he was senior economist at the IMF before. So we count on him on also telling us how you can finance uh, these enormous uh, investments. Um, uh, Mr. Oettinger, Commissioner Oettinger, uh, talked about some 200 billion euro that he foresees. That's an enormous sum. Uh, and uh, we are uh, eager to know how this can be uh, made. I would like to start with Jean Arnold Binois, uh, European Commission if you could tell us what the priorities are out of your view. Chairman, you put already the pressure on me because uh, mentioning my boss, uh, Mr. Oettinger, uh, of course, uh, he is um, the one uh, shaping the policy in the European Commission, but at the end it will be the European Parliament and the Council to agree on the, the priorities and the proposal we will make. So I will um, immediately go into the, the substance and I think uh, that when we are talking about uh, energy infrastructures, we need, of course, to see that in the global framework of um, the energy policy, uh, which is now uh, enshrined in the uh, Article 194 of the treaty, uh, where we have a number of uh, major 
uh, buzzwords, I would say, to reconcile. And um, uh, you know that uh, uh, we need to work in the field of energy in a spirit of solidarity, which uh, I think is, uh, is a nice word, but uh, which means that it has to be uh, translated into concrete actions, uh, which um, are, first of all, I think, uh, to ensure that our internal market is functioning properly. So uh, this is a, a major task. And of course, the internal market uh, may not function properly if uh, it is not uh, well equipped with uh, infrastructures and interconnections. And that is where, of course, there is a direct link between <clears throat> energy infrastructure and the uh, well functioning of the internal market. And these two are the preconditions to ensure security of supply uh, and uh, to uh, also help uh, to uh, improve energy efficiency and to particularly integrate the renewables um, in, the, um, in the system. So uh, we have there a clear uh, mandate in the treaty to uh, uh, ensure uh, the, um, all the benefits of the internal market for all citizens and for our economy. And uh, we have also uh, other objectives which are um, uh, in terms of uh, targets. And you know the targets we have, 20% of renewables in uh, 2020, which means, in fact, 35% in electricity generation and 20% uh, of reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. These two are binding. And the third one is 20% of energy efficiency, which is not binding. All this is uh, about internal market sustainability and security of supply. These three uh, principles are going together. And infrastructure are uh, the juncture of all these three uh, objectives. Uh, I think you see that the evolution of the energy policy is very fast. And we have uh, uh, tabled uh, a number of proposals in the recent years. And the uh, agreement has been achieved uh, between the uh, Council and the Parliament on the third internal market package, which is now fully into uh, force since March. Uh, we have uh, regulation on security of gas supply with a lot of infrastructure obligations also as a result of the crisis of January 2009. We have an energy strategy for 2020, uh, which is also clear. We have uh, made um, uh, a communication in November 2010 on energy infrastructure, which is, uh, has been very well received by the European Council and the Council, and also, I think, by the uh, Parliament, because the ITR voted a major report last week which will go in plenary uh, in July. And I think it's a very encouraging support to uh, all what the Commission said in, the, uh, in its communication of uh, November. And uh, this year, as you see, we have already the energy efficiency plan, which has been adopted by the Commission. Uh, we have um, in preparation the energy, energy infrastructure legislative proposal, which we intend to have in October and also the external energy policy communication, which is not uh, without links with uh, infrastructure, of course, and the Energy 2050 roadmap. So you see there's a, a lot of um, activities uh, going on under the authority of Commissioner Oettinger uh, to shape further the energy policy. Uh, I think uh, when we are looking at the, the priorities which have been set in our uh, paper on Energy 2020, uh, we have clearly a first priority, which is energy efficiency. And uh, this is uh, across all the sectors of uh, energy be, and also, of course, transport, for instance. Uh, but this is now the first priority, and this is maybe one of the most difficult to, to, uh, to implement because it is uh, across all kinds of sectors with difficult uh, measurements to be made uh, about the progress to be made and so on. But the priority number two is clearly building a pan-European energy market with an integrated energy network. So that is really the topic of the day. Uh, and um, uh, there is no internal market without infrastructure. And, and that must be clear. And we need to work on this. Uh, of course, technologies are also important. And we hope that there will be also uh, improvement in technologies being on the tra long distance transport of energy, but also in smart grids <laughs> and so on. And uh, we have, of course, to ensure security, safety, and affordable energy to uh, the citizens and to the economy. 
And again, this is also dealing with infrastructure because, you know, cyber terrorism is something which is now more and more uh, frequent. So electricity systems are also vulnerable. So we need also to deal with this type of thing. So we should not forget about uh, these uh, issues. And of course, safety of uh, uh, the transport system, tra energy transport system is also very important. And the external dimension cannot be separated from the internal market. Uh, the more we integrate our internal market, and the more, of course, we will have to deal with uh, third countries and uh, who are our suppliers, and we see that already with the EU-Russia dialogue, for instance, uh, but also with uh, other neighboring countries, and the Southern Corridor, which has already been mentioned, is a, a nice example in this respect. So uh, the basics are the internal energy market. And you know what is uh, being said about the internal energy market and, uh, we, and what are the main principles. Uh, we need to have uh, uh, an internal market at the EU level. That means uh, open market, integrated and competitive. Uh, and this is not only for gas, but it is also for uh, electricity. A uh, major issue is the separation of the infrastructure uh, management from the production. Uh, and uh, well, what is called sometimes ownership on bundling, but also uh, ISO, I2, and so on, um, which was a big discussion in the parliament in uh, 2009, I think. Transparency is absolutely key. Uh, we need to ensure that our infrastructure are best used. This is uh, very important. And we need to, um, to have a further market integration through framework guidelines and network codes, which uh, will set the rules at the European level for how to deal with the infrastructure. Uh, and that is very, very important, of course, to harmonize the way the network are managed by uh, the transport system operators and uh, uh, overseen by the regulators. So that is where the Agency uh, for Cooperation of Energy Regulators, which is now in Ljubljana, is important also in this respect, and the ENSO uh, for gas and electricity, which are major tools in this respect with their task to develop a 10-year network development plan uh, for uh, having a, a consistent planning at the European level. So all these tools are absolutely fundamental to develop the uh, future infrastructures of the uh, European Union. Now, all what we said in our communication of uh, November has been strongly backed by the European Council meeting of the 4th of February 2011, where first it has been said the internal market has to be complete by 2014, which means a very strong cooperation between the regulators, the TSOs, and the Commission, for instance, to develop the network codes, which have to be there by 2014. And that uh, it was also recognized that the infrastructures are absolutely key to achieve the targets uh, of 2020, 20 by 2020. And there was also an interesting uh, provision in these conclusions, which is we need to end the isolation of energy islands by 2015, which is a major challenge. It means, for instance, that the Baltic states, which are today isolated from the rest of the EU, have to be connected to uh, the other member states uh, in electricity. This means uh, not uh, uh, the, the, the smaller things, because you know the three Baltic states are still part of the Russian system of electricity. So how do you achieve the uh, connection of the three Baltic states with uh, the rest of the European Union and implement the uh, internal market rules? So this is a major issue, but also connecting the Iberian Peninsula, and Jose Brass knows uh, that, surely. Uh, means also to improve all the interconnections between uh, Spain and, and France, for instance, not only in electricity, but also in gas. So we have um, uh, also a good support of the European Council for the, the financing of infrastructure, where the principle is the user pay. In other words, in principle, the regulator should set tariffs uh, to, uh, which are incentivizing the investments by the TSOs, uh, and uh, the, uh, they, they should find a, a right return on their investment, and uh, these tariffs will be uh, in the uh, final price paid by the consumers. But there are a number of cases where this uh, has to be complemented by uh, more support, which could come uh, from uh, the taxpayer and um, uh, security of supply, for instance, has very often been quoted as a key uh, uh, principle to uh, to look at 
and where sometimes you need to have redundant infrastructure or to ensure security of supply, and the market will not finance this type of infrastructure. So this is uh, a major issue. And then the last issue, which is very important um, and di difficult, and where the European Parliament uh, will have really to take a position, it is streamlining and improving the authorization procedures, because it's quite clear that uh, it's nice to uh, wish uh, a lot of renewables in our energy mix, but uh, if you refuse to have the interconnections which are needed to bring these renewables to the market, uh, you are nowhere. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, will, I will start while the presentation is being put up there with some uh, preliminary remarks. Um, first of all, a uh, heartfelt thanks to uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Parliament and uh, the ALDI uh, group for this, uh, this invitation. Uh, special thanks to uh, MEP uh, Adina Valian. Uh, it's uh, really a, a pleasure to be uh, here to be able to, and to have the opportunity to present uh, the viewpoint of uh, a regulator uh, in this very important but also quite complex uh, uh, issue. Um, our, our chair, Mr. Chatimakarakis, uh, 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 posed a question uh, when he saw that I was from the IMF, and that is on you know, how to finance uh, uh, these, these projects. So I'll say a word about that. But b before that, uh, just to uh, co correct a uh, a very you know, generous uh, introduction by the chair that uh, said that I was the chair of the European Energy Regulators. Actually, I'm the chair of one of the working groups of the regulators, not of uh, the whole uh, 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 committee, uh, and that is the Implementation Benchmarking and Policy Working Group, which deals also with cost allocation uh, issues. Uh, on to the, the question of, of financing, and if I can start by disagreeing with uh, a, a statement by Mr. Vinoy, who said that uh, the market will not finance redundant infrastructure. Um, unfortunately, that's not true. The market will finance anything, redundant, useless, unnecessary, whatever, as long as it has a guarantee it will be paid for it. So the issue quickly becomes one of who will finance it to one of who will pay for it. So the real issue is what is the cost allocation that we decide on for, uh, you know, for these uh, uh, infrastructure investments. Um, in, a, in a country that neighbors uh, Portugal, I, I don't need to specify, you can guess, uh, there is a, a nuclear power plant that has been in existence uh, for several years. Uh, it has never been used because of you know, some local complaints, um, but it was financed, so it's been paid for, and uh, it has been included in the regulated asset base of the operator, and so it is being paid for by customers and will continue to be paid for over a 40-year period. So the issue is not you know, whether it will be financed, uh, but rather you know, how we can allocate the, uh, the, uh, the cost. Um, the, the, the IMF uh, is involved and is in the news more, again more uh, recently, uh, and it's usually uh, in the news for providing funds. But in addition to providing funds, it provides advice on governance, and um, usually the advice is to try to rely on markets wherever they can function, uh, and to rely on markets, of course, with appropriate supervision. And you know, this is where the role of the supervisor or the regulator is, is important. Europe has daunting energy challenges, um, and the, the response really combines hardware, namely the infrastructure package, and software, the third package which has been in uh, uh, full force for less than, than three months. It'll be, in two days' time, it'll be three months old. Uh, and this um, uh, third package legislation uh, was very, very much improved by the input of the European Parliament. Uh, you, many of you who were involved will recall how the initial proposals actually relied very, very heavily, too heavily on our, in our opinion, on the TSOs, who are you know, market operators, but of course have shareholders to reply to. Um, and uh, by, through the insistence of, of ITRI, of the European Parliament, the final third package was very much more balanced in balancing the input 
interest of the, uh, of the shareholders, of the operators, but also the public interest of the consumers. So there a lot more uh, uh, strength, a lot more functions given to the regulatory function and to uh, 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 protecting the interests of, uh, of, of consumers. The goods are a natural monopoly, so they always have to be uh, regulated. And having independent regulation, and the third package also goes further in this, in having regulation that is equally independent in all 27 member uh, states, uh, helps ensure that energy is both available and affordable. Now, these are two simple words, but th 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 there's a lot of meaning behind them. Uh, making sure that energy is available means making sure that the energy operators, that the companies involved, uh, if they are efficient, can survive, can make money in the market. Uh, and that there won't be blackouts, there will be good quality, consistent, reliable energy provided. Making sure that it's affordable means keeping the natural profit motive of these companies in check by making sure that they do not charge more than is necessary to have good quality uh, uh, energy uh, produced. And this balance between what is available and uh, what is affordable is you know, best provided by independent regulators who have, of course, the public interest at, uh, at heart, you know, as parliamentarians uh, do. And of course, we remain committed to work with the Commission, the Council and Parliament to ensure rapid, cost-effective completion of the internal energy market. And here I must uh, uh, also uh, say that the cooperation which the Commission has requested from regulators in preparing the infrastructure package has really been far, far greater, uh, and the transparency and the sharing of information in trying to work towards a, uh, a proposal that takes into view the, uh, the different visions of reality, uh, this I think we need to commend the Commission for, because they have done a better job this time than, than is frequently the case. Uh, let me turn now to the theme of paying for, for the infrastructure. As I said before, the difficulty is not finding financing. Uh, in fact, there are many uh, uh, funds and long-term investors, pension funds, insurance funds, etc., that are avid for good utility investments. So utilities do not have difficulty uh, in uh, uh, finding financing in the market, as long as they can assure that the payback is guaranteed. These are usually investments that last 40 years, and therefore uh, one has to make sure that there isn't any risk of obsolescence, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the upfront payment that is necessary will actually be compensated over the amortization period of the, of the investment. And I think it's, it's important to recognize the distinction between the financing of the initial investment, which is usually what is seen you know, when the investment needs to be made, and then how it's going to be paid. And invariably, if one can guarantee that it will be paid, then it will be financed. So the question then is, uh, who pays? And traditional cost allocation methods have served to modernize grids, increase interconnections, uh, internalize externalities. Uh, we have to remember that uh, cross-border interconnections is not something that is, that, that is new. Uh, the existing grid has already for decades had substantial investments uh, going across borders. So there is already a business as usual methodology that has assured that this will, this, this will, this will happen. And these same methods are appropriate for much, I'd say probably for most, of the new infrastructure investment which is envisaged go going forward. Um, however, there may be, I mean, there are some cases where uh, the traditional approach is not uh, appropriate, uh, and these new challenges require uh, new, uh, new new changes. And uh, you know, we, we, we can look at those more uh, more specifically. I will now turn to some uh, just quick answers to some of the points I, I received uh, through the kindness of the organizers. A, a list of questions to speakers, and of course a lot of these do not have anything to do with, with regulation, but those that have any impact on regulation, I will try just to say a few uh, quick uh, things about. Um, firstly, there's a, a question there about uh, what actions the European Commission envisage uh, to improve the regulatory framework for private investments. Um, we, we have to be careful, or rather we have to interpret carefully these calls for improve the regulatory framework, because 
very, very often they are simply another way of saying you know, uh, we need more, uh, more payments for operators, or you know, the operators want to earn more. And there, you know, it's, it's important to make sure that uh, operators earn enough, but not more than just the necessary to make sure the investments take place, because in the end, it's the consumers that they are going to pay for it. Uh, thank you, Jorgo. Thank you both. So, our panelists, excellent presentations. Um, well, I do have questions and I do have uh, worries, and certainly I don't have certitudes in this uh, matter, so um, this is uh, my approach to it. Um, it was said, and I do believe that uh, there is, uh, there are a lot of funds to be invested, private invested, in uh, energy infrastructure. And we need, and uh, it was already said, there are some conditions that this money will come or not to investments in energy in Europe. And I'm saying that because we must not forget that we are in competition with other parts of the world in terms of getting the money for our, the investments we need. I'm talking about private money. And of course, uh, this private money would need stability, harmonization of the regulation, and they would need unbundling, especially for transport. And I want to ask especially the um, represent, representative of the uh, commission, um, where do we stand on these three conditions? And if we can do more to fulfill them in order to get those private money being there willing to come. And uh, more comment than, uh, uh, no, and the question. Um, the Parliament gave some instruments to the Commission in order to have a good overview on the energy infrastructure at European level. Just to be mentioning um, the energy infrastructure, the notification um, with energy infrastructure. When is the Commission going to uh, present us? Where do we actually stand uh, in terms of our need for, uh, for energy infrastructure? Uh, there are new infrastructure funds uh, which are coming into uh, this market and that is uh, a good sign that uh, there is an interest by investors which are not uh, just energy players to, uh, to invest in this. Uh, I think the uh, most recent example was the uh, purchase by Elia which is the uh, Belgian uh, transmission system operator of 50 Hertz which is managing the Eastern German uh, network. And uh, they did that with uh, a private infrastructure fund. And I think this is uh, the, the type of thing we will see uh, more and more. But of course, for, for this to happen, which is attracting really the money uh, where, uh, where it is, uh, is uh, the need for a stable and predictable regulatory framework, uh, which is largely in the hands of uh, Mr. Braz as representative of the regulators. Uh, and there are a lot of discussions today uh, on a number of investments and about the rate of return which is accepted and then a lot of detailed rules such as the depreciation period and, uh, and so on. It's very tricky and at the moment I don't think we have a full harmonization of the conditions uh, at the European level and that it will be I think for the ACER uh, to, uh, to work on this and there's a, a huge room for improvement of the regulatory framework to make these investments attractive across Europe. So uh, I think, uh, again, we have surely a number of countries where things are working well, but this is not necessarily the case everywhere in Europe. And that is where we are, are of course, worried, and we want to create the best possible framework. Um, on, on the uh, notification of infrastructure, I know this regulation uh, has been adopted last year. I think this uh, regulation is mainly uh, has a very important uh, role to play for generation investment plans. Because if we are talking about transmission systems, we have now the European network of transmission system operators, and so E and and so G, uh, which have to make this 10-year network development plan. So they have a good knowledge of the portfolio of projects which are planned for the next 10 years. So in the field of transmission, I think we have there a tool which is important, but the regulation and notification of infrastructure will be important for knowing what's happening in generation. And this is another area where uh, today, we have not really uh, another tool than this one to, to know what's happening. Now, on the uh, question of uh, Mr. Schmidt, uh, of course, um, um, 
I think we have to assess fully the consequence of the uh, German decision and also uh, the, the other decisions which will be made by the German government to compensate for, for this. And uh, I think that next week the, the, the German government will come with a number of uh, measures which are there to, to compensate for uh, uh, the, the, the lack of generation. And uh, that means particularly how they will favor the renewable integration uh, uh, in, the, in the network. And I said uh, in my presentation that uh, there is a need of 5,000 uh, kilometers more interconnections in Germany to ensure the balancing of the system. And making these investments a reality will be a major challenge. Now transport is on the floor, and so transport is an issue with high speed. Maybe we can just uh, save a little time and uh, so that will, there will be enough um, time for the last panel that's very important as well. Yes, when we planned this hearing, we thought about what's really necessary for the internal market in Europe. Adina already pointed it out. and. Necessary is infrastructure in energy and in transport. And since I'm in the European Parliament, I'm a German member, I didn't mention before, I'm the coordinator of the, for the Liberals and Transport and Tourism Committee. Since I'm here, since 2009, I know that there is not enough money in the pot for the infrastructure of transport in Europe. Well, that was, wasn't uh, really a surprise for me, but I, now I know figures. For example, if we, would, uh, if we look for the transport network we need in Europe, um, we'll, we would need uh, just a figure of 500 billion euro till 2020. And for example, we have in the pot, so to say, uh, up to 2013, only 8 billion euros. So you see it's a big gap, and we have to think about how to fill this gap. That's why we are together here today. And of course, uh, we, in an alde group, we thought about priorities for transport politician pol policy, and of course, priority is financing. We thought about what to do. Maybe we can have a special transport fund. That was a special idea of our commissioner, Carlos. Uh, and then everybody in the parliament said, no, 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 no special fund. It's better to take something to have a better agreement with Commissioner Hahn in the regional cohesion fund that will be in the third panel. That's one possibility. Second, of course, we can be make be better use, efficient use of, of the money we have. We can uh, reduce the amount of priority projects in the uh, European networks. Uh, another possibility, we can look for more uh, public-private partnership for uh, project bonds. We can involve the European Investment Bank better. And I look at my left side because here's a representative from the European Investment Bank, Mr. Cothrop. Or we can in general, have more attractiveness for the private investment in our sector. So several possibilities, not one solution. And in the white paper, several of those possibilities are pointed out. So that's just a very short introduction. And now I would like to, to um, give the floor to my speakers. I mean, yes, indeed, transport uh, is a strategic choice, I think, in terms of investment for Europe. And uh, coming back in 2007 from Mauritania, uh, there was no other area where I wanted to come back, really. Uh, and, I, and I came back to the Transport Director General to develop uh, uh, with uh, Matthias Rüter and uh, now with Vice President Callas uh, an, a rather intense and in-depth uh, policy review which led us to change quite radically the view we have of the Trans-European Transport Network's policy. I will come back to that. That was done with you uh, in the Parliament, also with member states, but beyond uh, uh, European institutions, also with uh, stakeholders, because transport infrastructure is, as, as is the case for energy, also, of course, something which is being developed with, um, with other actors, notably infrastructure managers, and increasingly in, in most, if not all, member states, uh, regions are heavily involved in uh, developing transport infrastructure. But maybe let me say first, uh, and, and, and re restate what the white paper which uh, the Commission adopted a few weeks ago says about, uh, about investing in transport. It is a strategic choice for Europe because investment in transport needs to be decided, prepared, planned today. Because if we want a transport system which uh, copes with the challenge of mobility, copes with the challenge of competitiveness, but at the same time uh, addresses uh, satisfactorily the challenges of the environment, of CO2, of, of energy independence, we need to invest in a transport system which brings together 
27 national systems, but also brings together the various components of our transport systems. Lead times in innovation, lead times in infrastructure are very long, and this is why the Commission set out 2050 as a, as a target for a 60 percent reduction of CO2 emissions in transport, and then set out 10 additional ben benchmarks to make this uh, target uh, credible. We use 2050. It, it, this was, of course, uh, far away and, and, and I think raised some, some concerns. But at the same time, again, the lead times to invest in innovation and infrastructure are such that what we decide today and start to build or, or, or implement in the next 10, year, 10 years will indeed shape the transport system in 2050. The White Paper makes a second strong statement, uh, which is about why we need to invest in transport. I think it is not easy to justify investment in transport at national level. It's always a difficult discussion when you compare to energy, to education, to research. In which areas do you invest for the future? And I think that uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, transport at national level, but also at European level, sometimes, sometimes found it a bit difficult to explain that investing in transport is not just building highways or laying down rail tracks, it is genuinely investing in Europe's future. Firstly, because uh, this investment is needed to develop the, the transport system I just referred to, but also because transport is the basis for Europe's growth in terms of supporting trade. And if, and if you look at the white paper and at the 10 t policy, you will see that we will place an increasing focus on maritime ports and also land uh, border crossings at, as entry and exit points of the transport system. So we need an efficient transport system to support trade. We also uh, have a lot of data at national level and at European level to uh, illustrate that investment in transport, both innovation and infrastructure, has a direct effect, a net direct effect in terms of, in terms of job creation. And last, and certainly not least, if you look at the transport sector, Europe is a world leader. And I'm not sure we have that many other sectors where Europe is a world leader. We are world leader in transport services, in maritime services, to a large extent still in aviation services. We are world leaders in logistics. The main logistics companies are European companies. We are world leaders in equipment. I mean, Airbus is an obvious uh, example, but in high-speed trains, it's also still the case. And we're also world leaders in transport systems. If you look at uh, European rail uh, traffic management systems, for example, they're exported all over the globe. So today, the transport system and its actors is, has a leading edge, but the leading edge is obviously contested and is eroded. And I think that investing, continuing to invest in transport is not only about building a few more roads, it is about investing in one of the few sectors which is a real engine for Europe's growth. Having made that point, uh, I mean, obviously, then the question, uh, Ms. Meissner, is your, your question. I mean, how do we do that? Uh, and uh, I must say that your introduction uh, it was particularly helpful because you are laying out different options. Because there is, of course, not one solution to, uh, to improve uh, uh, Europe's capacity to invest in transport. Again, I will, I will cover more infrastructure uh, this afternoon because that is also the subject of your hearing. But I think that much of what I will say also covers innovation. And, and investing in transport uh, research and investing in innovative ways of developing uh, transport systems. Ms. Meissner, thank you. Uh, thank you first and foremost for the invitation to be here today. Um, yes, so the question is put to me, how much money does EIB have? This is, uh, I'm afraid we, I, I left my, my uh, credit card at home today. Um, no, let me, uh, what I'd like to do is to concentrate fairly briefly and concisely on the issues around financing uh, of European transport infrastructure. Um, and I want to, I will touch upon the role of EIB, but I want to place it actually in a, in a, in a larger context. Sean Eric said financing is, is the last mile problem. And I agree with him strongly insofar as issues of project preparation, program preparation, um, are absolutely crucial and fundamental. And I absolutely concur that many projects fail not per se because of a financing problem, but because of a, 
uh, a project preparation issue. That said, we should be under no illusion about the scale of the financing challenge that's being posed. The needs are very large. Mrs. Meissner quoted the 500 billion by the 2020, which even in the most benign of economic environments would pose uh, an issue to financial markets. If we place that challenge in the current context of a, a post-crisis financial market, the challenge becomes, I would argue, even greater. Why is that? <laughs> Parts of this are well known, the most obvious being the fiscal consolidation challenge that's uh, being posed to, to member states, in fact, to governments at all levels, uh, including the European level. So budgets are under con uh, being cut, and that, that poses a challenge for grant finance. Secondly, also well understood, um, is the essentially what's happening with the banking market. The banking market is emerging from, from the crisis, more or less. Um, but I would argue it's coming out as a somewhat different animal, uh, for good reasons. Um, and the implications of Basel III and the other regulatory environment uh, that is out there has changed the nature of the long-term finance that's available to projects. Perhaps the details are still to be seen, but the, that trend, I think, is also well understood. What's perhaps received less attention is what's happened to capital market financing in general, which prior to the crisis played a strong role, um, particularly in, uh, in sterling and some non-Eurozone uh, markets, but also played a, a significant role within the Eurozone. That market has effectively dried up since, um, since the crisis. So where there are large pots and pools of liquidity with pension funds, with the life insurance companies, they are effectively at the moment not targeting infrastructure, at least certain types of infrastructure assets uh, in general. Um, and that, I'll go on and explain a little bit later, but this is essentially part of the rationale for the project bond initiative. But the bottom line is, as a project sponsor right now, if you've got a project of 500 million or up, upwards from that, this is still a very significant challenge to raise the finance, even if the framework conditions are more or less okay, the fi ultimately the funding is, plan is, is rather solid. There are issues in terms of the, the conditions that you will get there out on, on the market. That's the context. That poses the question, what can be done at, at European level? And the most obvious uh, focus is, of course, on the, the, the first leg of the European budget, the classical European budget discussions. Um, this is very much the work of, of uh, the European Parliament, and these issues are well known. The second leg that I want to just highlight quickly would be EIB. And I think I have a chart which more or less summarizes what we've been up to in, in the field of transport finance. In terms of order of magnitude, um, we're at essentially around 10 billion um, a year uh, of support to 10, for 10 E and 10 T projects. Um, and so you can quickly do the sums. Right? 10 years of that is 100 bit. What does that involve? I don't want to go into the details, but essentially we're doing all the things you, you, would, have ex you, you would have expected of us. Um, a large bulk is, is a sort of classic traditional senior debt, long tenors, um, which has been particularly appreciated in, in, in recent, uh, recent times. We're also heavily involved in the project finance market. Um, so in that case, taking project risks. But what I want to stress as well, just uh, in passing, is that the bank is also 
involved very much not only in the financing but more upstream on, on actually trying to deliver the project pipeline. And that is both through organizations like EPEC, the, um, the European Centre of Expertise on PPP programs, uh, and through JASPERS. So if you like, you have the one leg, the classic EU budget. You have a second leg, EIB um, doing its thing. The discussion over the last year, really, with the Commission uh, has been very much, well, look, how can we try to make these first two legs work a little bit better together? And more particularly, in this context I've talked about, how can we get European budget plus EIB to actually help unlock substantial volumes of private investment? So this is the, the philosophy of leveraging private investment uh, and, and you find this notion of catalyzing, trying to find ways that we know there are pools of liquidity out there, how can we channel them into the infrastructure uh, which has the, the policy priority uh, in the European Union. I think it's, it's uh, very important because um, the cohesion is a key um, condition for long-term development within the European Union and I think it's important to say that um, we need a better coordination between uh, the territorial and sectoral policies uh, in Europe and we were uh, already talking about the coordination and that's uh, it's, uh, it's very important. That is why I think uh, today we should concentrate maybe on uh, how the new indicators and thematic priorities might help uh, in using structural funds uh, for financing infrastructure, not only in transport, but, but also in en energy. And um, as we all know, uh, most of the member states are not, uh, in, the, in this moment, are not reaching the targets in regards to the implementation of the infrastructure projects. We still have problems in, in several member states, so uh, we will need to find maybe a better solution to, to respond to this, uh, to this uh, higher risk of late delivery uh, and rate of, uh, rate of uh, absorption. And uh, yeah, we, we have a lot of questions. We know that we need um, um, good national strategies, but how we will do this? Uh, a better prioritization, but how we can, uh, we can be sure that through the new um, rules we will manage to, to have it. Uh, good quality projects, and then uh, how can we do this, uh, especially in the new member states where uh, we need more know-how and um, administrative capacity. So we will need to, to respond uh, to several questions. Uh, we, we also need more, um, there is a more need for a transnational network uh, if we talk about transport and uh, energy infrastructure and how we can improve this and how we can stimulate uh, uh, this type of programs through the structural funds and maybe the most important question, the most pragmatic question that was already um, raised uh, today how uh, those priorities, uh, transport and energy, are already reflected or will be reflected uh, in, within the, uh, the financial scheme of uh, structural funds. So there are uh, a lot of questions, a lot, a lot of concerns uh, regarding this, and I'm very glad that uh, we have today uh, the deputy head of, uh, head of unit uh, uh, from DG Radio, uh, Mr. John Walsh, uh, I'm very sure that he will detail uh, a lot uh, on, on this and he will uh, uh, give us uh, some answers <laughs> today. Thank you very much. It's true that I have a, a different role here. Uh, my colleagues have given us very clear presentations of how transport policy uh, objectives are being, are being developed by the Commission. Uh, through the 10T policy review, how the energy, the European energy policy priorities uh, are being delivered. And this is extremely important in the context of cohesion policy as well. I think it was Newton who said 
that if I'm great, it's because I'm standing on the shoulder of giants. Um, and and I, I just want to use that phrase to, to, to make the point that cohesion policy can be more effective where it's, where it's very clear what are the European priorities that can contribute, uh, that cohesion policy can contribute towards. And so if we, have, if we have a clearer framework for 10T, for instance, which we're planning and we're working together to do this with the member states, and, and we will then bring it to the parliament, but also in the area of energy, we've listened to, 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 to the colleague from DGNR, you can see how the commission is leading a debate about clearer energy priorities. And this can only help to clarify what are the correct investments, what are the right investments. But just one, one uh, introductory remark as well is, of course, the purpose of cohesion policy is not explicitly to finance, with the exception of the cohesion fund, it's not explicitly to finance certain sectors. Its purpose is to reduce economic and social disparities and to contribute to territorial cohesion. And so we always have to articulate the investment in trans-European transport networks also through the advantages that it brings in terms of uh, accessibility of the regions, contributing to trade and the movement of people. Uh, and so this, this is a very important part of uh, cohesion, the, whole, the, whole, the cohesion policy uh, development. Um, Financing, currently, the financing uh, dedicated to cohesion policy is 35% of the budget. Uh, but the advantages of cohesion policy are not only the financing it provides, but, but also, for instance, the cooperation that we encourage. Um, and if I just cite the European Baltic Sea uh, strategy for the macro region of the Baltic Sea, where you see reflected also we've encouraged the development of common energy priorities in the region. We've been contributing to that also with DG Ener, uh, and also uh, looking at the transport links uh, in the Danube strategy that, is, that has recently been finalized and presented uh, to the institutions. So it's not only the money, it's also the processes and the cooperation we encourage. Um, and so in this context, with these introductory remarks, what I would like to do is to take up your point, where are we starting from? And then, and then where, are we, where are we going? So just a, a brief reminder of um, the energy investments first, as, as this is the order that we've taken today. Under cohesion policy, this, this graph that I present you with is the absolute sums of money in millions of euros allocated by certain member states to three types of energy priorities. We have the uh, traditional energy sources, uh, which is the lighter blue. Uh, take, for instance, Poland. Or, or just over 1 billion euros are allocated to traditional energy sources, both largely storage and distribution of gas uh, and electricity. Uh, what is much more common, however, is investment in renewable energy sources. You see the, the darker uh, element of the bar. Uh, is rather widespread with some large sums of money allocated to it. And then the final color you see is energy efficiency. So you see there represented traditional energy, renewable energies, and energy efficiency. And the graph represents the absolute sums of money invested through cohesion policy. So what you see is, uh, is a little bit difficult to interpret because you, you have to understand its relative importance. And on average, the relative importance of energy in, in the overall mix uh, under, under cohesion policy is around 2.5%, 2.5% of investment. This rises to nearly 5% in a limited number of cases. Um, so this is the current position. I just wanted to highlight uh, three remarks in, in putting this in context. Between the previous programming period, 2000-2006, and the current programming period, we've seen a dramatic rise in the priority given to renewable energies and energy efficiency under the structural funds. This is not reflected in every member state, but in average, you see a very big uh, rise, up to tenfold increase overall in renewable energy and energy efficiency support. This can be, in some ways, relatively easily understood because 
these types of investments, it's distributed generation of electricity or it's, it's, it's investments in energy efficiency spread across the territory. It has strong links to the territory. It has strong uh, benefits uh, uh, across the territory. Uh, and maybe it's, it's understandable that we've got strong, uh, a strong increase in investments here. The third remark I wanted to make is that there is no strong uh, history of mobilizing the structural funds for traditional energy distribution or energy generation. And I've just cited a couple of possible explanations there. The profitability of these infrastructures uh, has meant that historically they have not been supported through uh, public investments. Uh, they're largely privatized or regulated companies. Um, with strong revenue generation capacities themselves. And of course, the whole context of liberalization has also made some member states question how they would package public uh, grant support to such companies. It's obvious that we will need, uh, of course, to, um, to work for the new regulation on cohesion policy, for the multi-annual, uh, multi-financial framework, and of course, we in, in the REGI committee, we are uh, fighting uh, very much for uh, having the same budget uh, for the next uh, programming period, at least to, to keep the same uh, amount uh, for the next uh, period, which, of course, it's, it's quite difficult. Uh, we, uh, we are also uh, discussing uh, regarding the priorities. Uh, we know that we will, uh, we will look on the priorities, but we would like that those priorities to come, first of all, from the local and regional level, and then come up to the national le level in order to be real priorities of the regions among, uh, among Europe. So there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, things to be discussed, a lot of challenges that we are still facing. Uh, we have the experience of the past, the previous uh, programming period, the experience of uh, the actual uh, programming period, with all the minuses. And uh, we have, of course, the, the problem of the public procurements, which we should, uh, we should address, we should find a, a solution. And we now in the parliament, we are working on, on this, on a, on a proposal together with the commission. So we will need probably to, to meet more often and to discuss more often about these issues in order to find a, a good solution and in order to have a cohesion policy uh, uh, oriented to, to, to better results as uh, we, we all agree that uh, we need it. Fortunately, we will have a second uh, round, second hearing on the same topic on 22nd uh, of June, so together with the stakeholders. So then we will have the opportunity to discuss more, to, to find more uh, answers to, to our questions and to, to find maybe more, uh, more solutions. Thank you very much again and hope to see you on the second hearing. Thank you. Thank you.